Thank you. Wow. Um, that's the kind of introduction that your father would believe and your, your mother would, <laughs> would also love. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I, folks, I'm a recovering accountant. And I repent every day. And I have to say I'm in awe of what you folks do. And I will tell you emphatically that you add more value to businesses than accountants, lawyers, and consultants combined. You are the reason businesses exist. So I want to talk to you today about being paid for the value that you create rather than the time that you spend. I believe there's great nobility in being paid what you're worth. And one of my heroes is Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker said, because its purpose is to create a customer, there are only two functions in every enterprise, marketing and innovation. Why only those two? Because only those two create results. Everything else in business is cost and effort and activity. The customer doesn't care about any of it. Only marketing and innovation are what matter. A business doesn't exist to, to be in court. A business doesn't exist to close its books or do accounting. A business is, exists to do marketing and innovation. And you're a big part of that. You're an enormous part of that. Consultants don't do that. Accountants certainly don't do it. Lawyers do it, but you guys do. So because pricing is obviously part of marketing, and I even think pricing can be part of innovation, I think one of the worst things that's happened in your space in the last 20, 25 years is when the profession went off commissions, you actually took five steps backwards and went to the billable hour. Now, there's mixed history on this. I don't know who's responsible for it. David Ogilvy claims in his book, Confessions of an Ad Man, that he's responsible. Other people have claimed uh, responsibility for it. I don't know who did it. I do know that everybody kind of looked around at the accountants and the lawyers and said, well, they do it, so it must, it must be really good because accountants and lawyers are really smart. Well, they're really not because it's destroying their industry too and it's draining their talent too and it's causing all sorts of problems in their world as well. Every profession that we work with that bills by the hour has the exact same problems. Lack of trust with the client, no, no, cl no client is happy with the billable hour. The firms aren't happy with the billable hour. So why does it stay around? Well, I don't know, maybe it's because of this quote from Ben Franklin, time is money. But this is nonsense, time is not money. Have you ever seen a clock with a checking account? You know, time is just time. Time is just time. I actually like Oscar Wilde's quote, time is a waste of money, because it can be that too, right? Time is not value. Time is not value. Time isn't even cost. Because if you're an ad agency leader, you're not paying your people for their time. You're paying them for their talent and the outcomes that they can produce. Time, folks, is nothing but a constraint. And to use time to measure anything is the equivalent of measuring gravity. I mean, it makes no sense because gravity is a constant. And so is time. And we can't use time to measure the worth of talent and creativity and innovation. Because it doesn't work that way. It's like plunging a ruler into the oven to determine its temperature. It's the wrong measuring stick. But yet we're just, we're so committed to this. And there's so much unlearning, I think, that has to be done around this whole billable hour timesheet and we need to change the language as well. Peter Drucker also said that the customer never buys a product. The customer buys value. They buy a satisfaction of a want. We buy value. Prices are ultimately set by value. They're not set by your competition. Otherwise, how do you explain Apple? If any of you have an Apple in front of you, a product, you, you paid a fortune for it. That's not set by their competition. Apple's pricers aren't looking at the competition to set their price. They're looking at the value of the product and the brand and everything else they bring to the table. And they're pricing for it. 
we're making a profit as their customers and they are making a very decent profit for what they do because there's great nobility in that. Profit allows them to continue R&D and continue, us, continue to surprise us with great innovations. The thing that I love about innovation and creativity, and Terry so, talks so eloquently about it, is innovation and creativity can't be planned. By definition, it takes us by surprise. It grabs us by the throat and delights us. And you can't measure innovation and creativity. We've gone metric mania in the professions. We measure everything. Well, measurements don't make up for crappy advertising and crappy marketing and crappy innovations and bad ideas. You can measure all you want, but by definition, a measurement is about the past. Trust me, I know, I'm a former accountant. We're historians with really crappy memories. We come in after the, wound, uh, after the battle and bayonet the wounded. Innovation's about something new. Folks, there's no data on something new. That's what takes the world by storm, is that innovation, that, that risk-taking, that, that, that it's the leap where we gain the knowledge, not the look, it's the leap. And it's all about value. And I know I'm in a room with, a, with marketing experts and I'm not a marketing expert, but I want to give you the first law of pricing. And that is that all value is completely subjective. Now, I think you have a better grasp on this than accountants and NBAs because we like numbers. We like to carry things out to two decimal places. My profession rather be precisely wrong rather than approximately right. Because we're so hung up on the data. Everything's got to be objective. But when it comes to value, it's completely subjective. Let me prove it to you. If you think about a bottle of water, we have bean counters that can tell you how much it costs Coke to produce a bottle of water. It, it's, a, it's a guess, by the way, but that, that's a separate issue. Cost accounting is merely opinion, not actual fact. But, and we can, so we know the cost, and you can think about the price that you'd pay for this. If you bought it in a store, maybe it's, you know, I don't know, 50 cents. If you bought it in one of those warehouse stores where you buy it by the pallet, it might cost you a dime a bottle. If you bought it at a, at a footy game, an AFL game, a hockey game, a rugby game, it cost you a lot more. If you bought it in a mini bar, it cost you even more. I don't want you to think about the cost or the price. I want you to think about the value. Because there's three components to every transaction. There's cost, price, and value. And we usually just focus on the cost, especially if you're dealing with procurement. The customer is somewhat focused on the price, and of course they want to get that price down. But what about the value? What's the value of this? Ah, well, that's an interesting question. Because if I'm in the desert and I haven't had water for four or five days, this is priceless, right? I'd give everything I have and, and even go into debt to get it. Not infinite, but, but really, really high. But if I'm home washing the dog with the same quantity of water, now it's worth a lot less, right? And what if I'm flooded in my basement with water? Now it's got a negative value. I have to pay somebody to pump it out. How did the same H2O go from really, really high value to negative value? How did that happen? You know cost accountants can't explain that? Accountants can't explain that? Nobody can explain that except economists who have a theory of value, and that theory is all value is subjective. Because certainly the cost of getting the water to those three locations doesn't explain how it can be so high and so low at the same time, or negative. Only a cohesive and coherent theory of value can explain that, and we have one. And that it is, all value is completely subjective. So, we talk about these three components to every transaction. There's cost, and really the customer doesn't care about the cost of something. Nobody goes into the Porsche dealership and says, oh, what an awesome car, and turns around to the salesman and says, can I see the timesheets on that? I'd like to know how long it took Porsche to make that. That's not how humans buy anything. That's absurd, right? So we know that there's a price, and of course, the difference between the price and the cost is what we bean counters love to call profit. 
And when we talk about profit, we talk about only the seller's profit, the business's profit, the agency's profit. But what about the customer? Where's the customer here? Well, the customer is there because what they're buying is value. If you went to a coffee shop this morning, you spent $4 for a flat white, you only bought it because it was worth more to you than the $4 that you spent. Now, how much more? I don't know, maybe $4 and a penny, maybe four and a quarter, maybe $12 because you were hung over last night from drinking too much and you're addicted to coffee. It doesn't matter. From an economic perspective, all I have to observe is the fact that you bought a cup of coffee for $4. That means by definition, it's got to be worth more than $4 to you. Otherwise, you would have stayed at home, made a cup of coffee in your home for a dime. Now, Australian coffee is wonderful, but I think it's pretty hard to argue that it's 40 times better in a cafe than at home. But yet, we spend money on coffee all the time because it's contextual. We're on our way to work, we go into a coffee shop with a friend or to read a book, whatever it might be. In other words, the spread between the value and the price is what I'm going to call the customer's profit. We don't have a really good term for this. Economists call it consumer surplus, but nobody knows what that means. So we started calling it the customer's profit. Every time the customer engages you to do something, they are, they are expecting a profit. Now, does it always happen? Well, hey, do you ever buy anything that you regret? <laughs> do you ever have buyer's remorse? Of course it doesn't always happen, but you expect it to happen. So there's always an element of risk with any purchase, right? My, my Mac could blow up and I'll have to go down and get a new one. But a service has got a higher risk when a customer buys a service. What happens if your veterinarian screws up your dog or your accountant screws up your tax return? So services are, are incredibly more risky than products. And your services even more so because your services are an art. I think you're in the art of persuasion. You could say rhetoric in the classical sense, meaning persuasive communication. But the point is that when the customer enters into a transaction, they don't really care about the cost. They want to lower the price. We, of course, want to raise the price as sellers. But what do we both want to do with the value. We both want to maximize it. Shouldn't the conversation start there? Shouldn't the conversation be about the value that we're bringing to the table, that we're creating for the client? It shouldn't be about the cost, because they don't really care about that unless they're procurement, and then they're cost obsessed. They want to lower the price, but they, we both want to maximize the value. It's where our interests are completely aligned. The more you can get the buyer's profit up, the customer's profit, the client's profit, the higher your price can go. Value pricing isn't about gouging the client. Value pricing is about charging a price that's commensurate with the value that you're, that you're creating and leaving enough for the client to have a decent profit as well. So some rules about, some, some axioms about value is value from an economic perspective, because I think this word has been corrupted, is the maximum amount a consumer will pay for an item. The problem with, it's a useful definition, but the problem with it is, it doesn't come tattooed on the client's head how much they're willing to pay for your services, right? So in some cases, they don't even know. I understand that, that's the risk and uncertainty that all businesses are in. When Steve Jobs put out the first iPad, iPod, he had no idea that the market would accept it. He had no idea. He doesn't know customer research. He had no focus groups. It was a massive risk. Of course, it paid off because all profit comes from risk. The other thing about value is pricing is how we divide up value. It's how we, we, we divide up the value between us and the customer. And that, I think that's a very useful way of looking at it. The other thing, according to Michael Munger, he says prices reconcile disagreements about value, right? Because we only exchange when there's an unequal value. You buy the, the water from me for a dollar because you value the water more than the, your dollar and I value your dollar more than the, I value the water. 
That's an unequal exchange. Exchange is not based on equality. Exchange is based on inequality of perceptions of value. And that's really important to understand, I think. And here's the ultimate thing, and I think this is what you folks understand better than the MBA and accounting types. Because when you boil all this down, when I say the first law of pricing is all value is subjective, that means if you follow that logic, the value is a feeling. It is not a number. Stop trying to quantify it. This is something that accountants love to do. They think, well, if we add up the hours that go into something, we can quantify its value. No, you can't. That's absurd. I can spend my life writing a book that nobody reads and nobody buys. Is that, does that make the book valuable because I spent years and years toiling over it? Of course not. That's not how it works. And it's certainly not how it works in an innovative and creative profession such as yours. I live in Northern California and Napa is in my backyard. One of my favorite wineries is a winery called Fraunente. It's Italian for do nothing, which is probably why I like it. Um, they make a particular Cabernet that I've been buying for years that's reserved, the state bottled, it's limited production. They don't do it every year. And Farnente is like a $300, $400 bottle of wine. This particular vintage that I've been buying for special occasions for people is about $250, $300 more than that. So you'll spend 600 bucks on this wine. I probably bought a dozen bottles over a period of years as special gifts and presents. It's got a beautiful label. People make a candle out of the bottle. I mean, and it's lovely wine. Um, but I finally took a tour. And the tour guide took us down to the sparrow room and he said, this is where we make this particular wine. I'm like, oh, the wine I've been buying, great. He said, because of all these complex things that I don't understand, they can't bottle the wine using their automated bottling equipment. They have to pay people to come down to the barrel room, stand there at the barrel, and fill it by hand. They can't use the automatic corking equipment. They have to cork it manually. They have to ship it in different packages. The tour guide explained this to the 12 of us there, and then he looked at us and he said, and that's why this wine is more expensive. And everybody on that tour nodded their head and I turned to my colleague and I said, should I ruin this tour and give this guy an economics lesson or should I just forget about it? Well, folks, it, he's confusing cause and effect, but ask yourself this truthfully. If you're charging by the hour, is his explanation correct? Yes, it is. We spent more time, we incurred more costs, therefore the price is higher. But that's false. That's not the way the world works, and that's not what's happening in this transaction. Not at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Let me show you what's really happening with this bottle of wine. Cost plus pricing, which is where hourly billing comes from. Hourly billing is cost plus pricing's ugly cousin, <laughs> okay? Uh, and it basically says, okay, we're going to make this bottle of special wine and it's going to cost us more than our normal wine because of all these additional costs. We're going to take that cost that the bean counters compute and we're going to mark it up with some desired level of profit. That's the plus in cost plus pricing. The plus is profit. How much profit do we want to earn? Kind of like the world owes us a living. <laughs> And because we incur costs, we automatically get profit. But most companies don't make profit, or a lot of companies don't, and a lot of companies go bankrupt. But put that aside for a minute. Then we sit in our winery with our fingers crossed, and we engage in the fifth P of value. Do you know what the fifth P of value is? It's prayer. <laughs> and we pray that the value of this bottle of wine that we spend all this money producing is greater than the price to people like Baker who buy it. Where's the customer in the chain? At the end. Who's the ultimate and sole arbiter of value? The customer. Folks, this is backwards. This is not how the world works. Now, 
I want to slide in a fact that I know you're going to be able to grasp because it's, it should be glaringly obvious, sometimes it isn't, even to accountants. But if this did explain the real world, then no business would ever, ever, ever go bankrupt. Because it doesn't take a rocket science scientist to put a price above a cost. Your 12-year-old can do it. So why do businesses go bankrupt? Because they don't make things of value. Take BlackBerry, not picking on BlackBerry, but good pricing wouldn't have helped BlackBerry. BlackBerry failed because they failed to keep up with innovation. They fell off the innovation curve. So what's really happening with Farnente, and if you can grasp this, you're, you're two thirds of the way home to understanding value pricing, and I'm not kidding when I say that. The agencies that have made this transition, and there are many, there are hundreds, there are hundreds of agencies, folks, that do nothing by the billable hour, and they don't do timesheets. We are single-handedly at Veris Age Institute, with the help of my colleagues around the world, bearing both the billable hour and the timesheet. It's my quest in life. And the agencies that have done it, and other professional firms, law firms, accounting firms, IT firms, consulting firms, they follow the bottom chain. They start with the customer and say, what is the value of the wine to Baker? That sets the upper boundary of the price. The price is less. I am going to earn a profit, hopefully, when I buy it and give it to somebody and make them feel good, make me feel good. Or if I drink it on my own, I feel even better. Um, but then, and this is key, the price justifies the additional costs that Farnenti has to spend to produce that wine. It's not that the cost determines the price, it's that the price I'm willing to pay because of the value justifies the cost Farnenti is going to incur to produce a wine that I like. But the customer comes first in this chain. And for financial types, getting your head from the top to the bottom requires a lot of unlearning. I don't think there's anything complicated about that bottom, that bottom chain. You know what's hard about this change? The unlearning that we have to do as a profession to move away from that, which we've been doing for decades, and move to this. It's not so much learning something new, I think it's unlearning the old. Letting go of the old so we can embrace the new. You know, Peter Drucker used to say, that the body has a natural discharge system of, for waste, but corporate bodies do not. It's a good point. We kind of hang on to yesterday, right? We, we, invest, we keep investing great talent, money, into yesterday's products rather than in tomorrow's potentials. So he thought we needed to shed things to move forward, constantly shed things. His famous question, if you weren't in this industry today, particular sectors say, would you enter it? And if not, what are you going to do about it? And that's a really important question to ask yourself every now and then from a strategy perspective. So I want you to follow the bottom perspective or the bottom chain here. And in order to do that, we've got, I've got an eight step framework. I obviously don't have time to go through all eight steps, but let me just give you the most important one, which is having a value conversation with the customer. That value conversation does not start with, what do you need, Mr. Customer? Show me the scope of work. Show me the brief. It's not about deliverables. It's, what are you trying to accomplish? In other words, we're starting with scope of value. Why? Well, because that's something we're both trying to maximize, but also, doesn't scope of value ultimately determine scope of work? Because there might be different ways to achieve the same end if we start with the end in mind. So it's actually scope of value that comes first, not scope of work. And most professionals love to dive into scope of work first because that's our comfort zone. That's where we feel safe, right? Oh yeah, great, we've got a brief, we've got deliverables, blah, blah, what do we have to do? No, no, we need to step back and be diagnosticians, just like doctors. And we need to ask questions. And we need to ask better questions. And this is part of changing the language 
There's a great book out there called A More Beautiful Question. It's by a guy named Warren Berger. I highly recommend this book because it's all about the art of questioning and questions are an art. And the better you are at the value conversation and the art of questioning, and that means you talk about 20% of the time, the client talks about 80% of the time, because you heard Terry say the number one thing they complain about, they don't understand my business. You know why we don't understand their business? For the same reason accountants and lawyers don't understand their client's business. We don't ask enough questions. We assume we're geniuses and we know everything. You look at a company like McKinsey, they send these 24-year-old snot-nosed MBAs into these companies and they think they're gonna tell these family companies that have been around for generations how to run better. These kids know nothing but they have, they, and they do something, and they have something that we don't. Because consultants are not paid for answers. They don't have the answers. The client always has the answers. The consultant is paid for the question. A great question begs to be answered. Everybody can identify a great question, and the dumbest kid in the room can come up with the greatest question in the world. It's questions that spark ideas and creativity and innovations. And the book documents that really well. We need to get better at questions and spend more time in it. The military down here in Australia has a great saying that I learned from a soldier. Time spent in reconnaissance is never wasted. Imagine going to a doctor and having him or her prescribe before they diagnose. That's called malpractice. And it destroys our value when we don't step back and say, what are you trying to achieve? What's the scope of value? My favorite definition of what it means to be a professional is from Michael Hammer. And he says, a professional is someone who is responsible for achieving a result rather than performing a task. And my problem with the billable hour and the timesheet, one of my problems, I have many. How much time do you have? Is it? turns everything we do into a task. It's, it's, it's like, you know when a friend or a loved one has a baby? Do you want to hear about the labor pains or do you want to see the baby? We want to see the baby, but think about our business model. <coughs> Not only do we focus on the labor pains, we build them out in six minute contractions. <coughs> All the while, the client cares about the baby, we're taking our eye off the ball by what we're measuring inside of agencies. Our measurements should measure the success of the agency the same way the client does. And no client cares about how many hours you lie on your timesheet. And you do lie on it. And I don't mean maliciously, I mean because we just can't remember. What did you do for the last two weeks? I don't know. Hell, look, I was here. Let me give you a tangible example of this. I need a landscaper. I find three on Google or Yelp or whatever that look pretty fairly decent. I got such a major problem with landscapers, you wouldn't believe it. I've lived in my house for 20 years. I think I fired 12 of them. The first guy comes out, gets out of his truck. He's got his clipboard. He's walking around the yard. We know what he's doing. He's scoping the property, right? How long is this going to take me? How many bushes are there? Trees? What's the backyard look like? Doesn't, doesn't talk to me really, just kind of mumbles and drawing on his clipboard. And he says, Ron, no problem, we can handle this. We're 40 bucks an hour. Okay, well, that, that generates more questions than it answers. Right? Are you gonna, great, you're gonna send your kids out here to do this every week? I mean, how long, you know? That's, so he's charging me based on inputs. The second guy comes up, pulls out, gets out of his truck, same thing, he's got the clipboard, walking around, he's scoping the work, scope of work. Edging, mowing, how many bushes, blah, blah, blah. He says, Ron, no problem. We can do all this. $100 a month. Okay, a little bit better. He's not pricing based on inputs. He's pricing based on outputs. He, he's looked at the scope of work and said, it's 100 bucks a month. But the third guy pulls up in his truck. He gets out of the truck. He's got a clipboard, too, and he's doing the same thing, too. He's scoping the work because he's a pro. This isn't his first rodeo. He's done this before, but then he engages me in a conversation. So Ron, tell me, what do you do for a living? 
Oh, I travel a lot, I'm a writer, I speak, I'm a consultant. Not home a lot. <clears throat> no, now either he's casing the place or he's really trying to get to know me. Um, but he says, and I take it from our phone conversation that you're not Martha Stewart. You don't really like yard work. No, I hate yard work. This bores me to tears. I don't want to think about my yard. I don't even want to look at it. He said, so why are you finding your existing landscaper? I said, because when I'm here and he's here, which happens about once every Halley's Comet passing, because I'm not home a lot, I said, I have to go outside and point out things to him. Why is this bush dead? Why doesn't the sprinkler work? I said, he's out here every week. He's the professional. Shouldn't he be fixing this? I'm paying him for a result, not a task, a result. Keep things in working order as part of that result, in my mind. He's doing an unprofessional job. He says, oh, I quite understand. That can be very frustrating. So he engages me in more conversation. He actually gets to know me and tries to figure out what is my value proposition. Not only what my pain points are, but what I'm looking for. He comes to the end and he says, Ron, you can handle all this, no problem. He says, not only that, but you're not even gonna have to think about your yard. Everything will be in perfect order. We'll even plant different bushes for the different seasons you're not going to have to worry about your sprinklers not working, and we'll take care of all the settings and, you know, for the different, you know, sunny and rainy seasons and all of that. He says, and by the way, you'll have the best curbside appeal in the neighborhood. I'm $300 a month. Who do I hire, folks? Now, a lawyer said, well, you hire the first guy. <laughs> I hired the second guy. You know why? The third guy is a figment of my imagination. I can't find the third guy. I would pay the third guy $500 a month. But landscapers don't use this language. They don't engage in the conversation. They don't have the diagnostics. They're too busy scoping the work and not paying a damn attention to the customer at all. And that's really, really frustrating if you're a customer. And here's the rub. If I could find this unicorn landscaper, and I was in Columbia and they said, and somebody came up to me, he said, my husband's the third landscaper. I said, great, here's my card. I will commute him to California with all of his tools and he can take care of my, my, my yard. By the way, this is not my yard. <clears throat> here's the rub with this. If I did find the unicorn landscaper for 300 a month, would I be a happier client? Yeah, G gladly. I mean, I'd be thrilled. I would be thrilled. My profit would be off the charts because value is subjective. Now, if that landscaper goes next door and talks to my neighbor who loves yard work, that neighbor has a completely different value proposition than I do. And if the landscaper tries to treat him like he treats me, it's not gonna work. That's why we have to price the client and not the services. Stop pricing scope of work. Start pricing the customer. That's where pricing is moving. Individualized pricing, airlines, hotels, rental car companies, even stores to some extent are using dynamic pricing. If you go on travel websites <clears throat> and you use a Mac, you'll probably pay 20 or 30% more for your hotel and airline bookings than if you're using Windows. Why? because people that own Macs are less price sensitive. Pricers know that, and they adjust accordingly. So, we need to focus on the scope of value. So let me give you what I think is the best opening line that we shamelessly stole to start your value conversation. Mr. or Mrs. Client, we will only undertake this engagement, this campaign, whatever, whatever you call it, if we can agree to our mutual satisfaction that the value we are creating is greater than the price you are paying us. Is that acceptable? Now, I've shown this to procurement. I've shown it to people who hire lawyers and accountants and agencies. And they say, we would love if our people spoke to, like this to us because I have to justify what we're paying the agencies to my boss. And if I understood the value, that would be much easier. This sets us on a value quest. This sets us on uncovering every stone of value and looking for that those pain points and those opportunity points that we all have, that all clients have. 
And it also lets you know what the client's end result is. What's the desired state of the future? You know, it's that question that if we were to have coffee in six months or a year, or, you know, whatever the timeline is, and you were really delighted with our work, why would you be so happy? I mean, that's kind of an inspiring question to think about because it makes the client think about the desired state of the future. Our job as professionals is to get them there. And that's called a transformation. And transformations are highly personal, highly individualized, and they're at the top of the value chain in terms of pricing power and differentiation. But I think the language needs to change. If we don't talk about value, trust me, procurement will make you talk about hours and overhead and costs and inputs and rate cards and timesheets and all the stuff that doesn't matter. They're hiring you to build their brands. They're not hiring you to do timesheets or for them to audit your timesheets. This is a waste of resources and incredible talent. When I think of the talent that is wasted on filling out timesheets on a global scale, it's staggering to me. Staggering. Not to mention how much agencies and firms spend running the beast. We call feeding the beast. Folks, we've estimated seriously 7 to 14 percent of a professional firm's revenue goes to feeding that beast. What's the ROI? The ROI is unhappy employees, demoralized, alcoholism, you know, all sorts of stuff. But it's not a good return on investment. By the way, that, that uh, let me go back here, that was shamelessly stolen from McKinsey. This is how McKinsey opens up every single engagement, whether it's a current client or a brand new client. This is how they start. And by the way, if they can't come up with an agreement that they can create more value than the price the customer's paying, they don't do the engagement. We both have to win. We both have to walk away with a profit. Now, we can talk about that split. It doesn't always have to be 50-50, whatever. But the bottom line is both have to win. There can't be, this is not a zero-sum game. Business is not zero-sum. It's not a poker game. It's not a sports game. One side wins, one side loses. That's not how business works. Wealth is created because both parties walk away. And you know where you see this illustrated? When you buy that cup of coffee and the barista hands you the coffee and you hand over your $4, you say thank you and they say thank you. It's a double thank you moment. You only do that because you're both more pleased than you were before the transaction took place. That's what transaction means, by the way the action after the transaction. What happens after? Well, hopefully you had a great cup of coffee and you'll come back and maybe even refer people. So when we talk about creativity not being able to be measured by time, this is what I mean. I operate very strongly with my instincts and I really either get, if I don't get it in the first crack, I get it in the second. And if I don't get it in the second, I almost never get it. Because, it, as I said, it's like a, it's very intuitive kind of process for me. I've never been a refiner. Um, I, my best work are kind of big, bold strokes that came very quickly. And it's problematic because some of clients like, a lot of clients like to buy process and they think they're not getting their money's worth like I solved it too fast. I mean, Michael Beirut told me to shut up in an initial, initial meeting. I drew the Citibank logo, uh, you know, after we had the first meeting, I drew it on a napkin, walked out. You know, they had a, they had a merge Travelers and City and Travelers had an umbrella and, and Citibank is a word, you know, in the lowercase thing of a T is an umbrella, you stick an arc on the top and you got it. I mean, it didn't take, you know, it's like it's a second, you know, it's all over the world. Like, how can it be that you talk to somebody and it's done in a second? But it is done in a second. It's done in a second in 34 years. You know, it's done in a second and every experience and every movie and every thing of my life that's in my head. She says two profound things in that clip. She says, clients like to buy process. No, they don't. They like to buy outcomes. If my landscaper, if my unicorn landscaper could do my yard in a minute, I'd be thrilled. His value to me isn't how long he stays out there. In fact, I, same with a plumber. A plumber can fix it in a heartbeat. I'm thrilled. Value is not measured by time. It can't be. It's not about process. It's about the transformation. My favorite philosopher is Dr. House. And he says, oh yes, a process. Wouldn't want to disrupt the process with results. 
right? We've got to follow the process. The second profound thing she says in there is, no, this didn't take me a second. It took me a second plus 34 years. Every book I read, every movie I watched, every TV show, we should be charging for the years, not the hours. Because your wisdom, your experience, your intelligence, gu guided by experience, is all part of your value proposition, your unique value, like Jonathan was talking about, being you. That's something that nobody else can do. That is a differentiator. And it can't be measured in time. So let me just give you a piece of low-hanging fruit. One of the things that you can do with your pricing that's incredibly innovative is offer your clients options. So think of the American Express card, right? You think about the green card, the gold card, the platinum card, and this leads us to the second law of pricing, which is all pricing is contextual. What we are willing to pay for something is human beings, and I just, and I just talk about human beings because you know what? We're all just human beings. IBM buys nothing. Apple buys nothing. People inside of those companies buy things, and they bring their own subjective value judgments and assessments of risk and feelings and all of that to the transaction. And yes, the CMO will value you different than the CEO and procurement. Absolutely, I can't change that because value is subjective. We've already established that. What that means is our language needs to change between the CMO and the CEO and procurement. We need to change the language. But what we're willing to pay for something is highly contextual. If I said, would you like to buy my unicorn, you'd have no idea what to pay because my guess is you've never bought a unicorn before, right? So we're always looking for that comparison. My guess is, folks, where you get your car washed, you see something like this. Is that true? Show of hands. Why is it that car wash establishments have better and more sophisticated pricing than professional firms? <laughs> we give one price, take it or leave it. They give us choices. Do human beings like choices? Have you ever wondered why every business on the planet gives you three choices? Tall, medium, or, you know, small, medium, large, and first class, business class, coach, and so on. It happens everywhere, except in professional firms, especially those who bill by the hour. Well, that's starting to change, right? Because, because value is so contextual, um, and this is one of my favorite lines to prove that. I mean, Homer's another great philosopher. Uh, it, 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 by the way, if you go into a restaurant, especially a you know expensive one, you might see a ten thousand dollar bottle of wine on the menu. It's probably not even in their cellar. Why is it there? Well, because it makes my six hundred dollar farniente look like a steal, and you're more likely to buy that one. And that's proven. It's it's a, it's a field known as menu engineering, and uh, we know the effects of of how humans make decisions. We, we're starting to understand this really really well, but. You think about this cup of coffee, right? And you think about the context. If I were to remove the most, the tallest one there and replace it, or I'm sorry, take out the bottom one and replace it, the middle one would still be the most popular. Because it's not about the quantity that's in the cups, it's about their relative position in, in the lineup. And most people will pick the middle because we don't like to go to extremes. We've got that extreme aversion because we think, oh, well, the, the, the small one's not enough or it's not going to be good if I buy the cheapest version. But the most expensive one's probably got too many bells and whistles, so I'll be safe and pick the one in the middle. So clients usually pick about two-thirds of the time the one in the middle. Some agencies that have been developing options, they look like something like this. This is a campaign for an airline web development assignment. And you can see the options were 200 grand, 400 grand, 650. They're all encompassed bundled option. This is not line, we're not line item, line item pricing the scope of work. We're bundling for three specific different types of outcome. It's much, as, much like if the landscaper would have said to me, gave, gave, gave me three options, it might have been something like, we'll do regular yard maintenance. The middle option would be, we'll bring you up to neighborhood standards. The top option might be, we'll give you the best curbside appeal. Now I might not want the best curbside appeal but I would if I was selling my house within six months, right? If we never offer the client a top option, what will never happen? We'll never sell one. I promise you that. So you've got to give the client three options, and then that forces them to convince themselves 
of the appropriate value price trade-off that they want to make. It also shuts down negotiation. So when procurement comes around and says, well, you know, you re really need to sharpen your pencil on this. You're the most expensive bidder. And of course, they tell all the bidders that. And you say, no, we have sharpened the pencil. $200,000 is our lowest price. If you don't want that price, you walk. You walk. You, you wouldn't cut that price a nickel for your own mother. That's it. That's the walk away price. And we have to get better at saying no, especially saying no to procurement. Stop filling out rate cards. Stop disclosing your overhead. Change the conversation to outputs and outcomes even better. You can do this gradually. You can do it one client at a time. Give three options on a proposal. We're seeing this more and more. This is a liquor brand digital campaign. I know this is an eye chart. You can't see this. I'm just showing you real live agency examples that have done this. And it's incredibly successful. And most of the time, the people pick the middle option. Once you get really sophisticated, you can start to do four options. But you can never go above four because we can paralyze people with too many options. And you can't do two because two is not enough. If you give people two options, it's a price decision, and more times than not, they'll pick the lowest of the two prices. When you give people three options, it becomes a value decision, and more times than not, they'll pick the middle option, and sometimes they'll pick the top option. Rory Sutherland, who was the president of the IPA for a couple years, and he's at Ogilvy in the UK, vice chairman, brilliant guy. He's got four TED Talks. He's got all sorts of talks you can find online. I highly recommend you watch a couple of them. Not only is he hysterically funny, but he's profound. And he's become a behavioral economist. Uh, and one of the things he said during his presidency is hundreds of agencies have developed models for how advertising works. What's needed now is for agencies to base their business on how people work. He, his message during his presidency was, if ad agencies don't become behavioral economists, they're going to become obsolete. So he started a unit in Ogilvy called the Nudge Unit, which is full of actual behavioral economists, behavioral psychologists, psychiatrists that actually understand human behavior. Let me just give you one example. A car company came to him and said, we'd like to give people 3,000 euros off the price of our $25,000 car. Not a particularly strong car brand either. And the behavioral economists looked at it and said, well, is that, a, is that the best we can do? And they said, well, 4,000 euros would be better, but we don't have 4,000 euros. He said, no, no, I don't mean that. He says, but rather than giving the 3,000 euros off the $25,000 price, why not add 3,000 euros to the trade-in value of their car? And the car executives looked at him and they said, well, that's the same thing. He said, well, it's the same thing if you're an economist. It's not the same thing if you're a human being. Because $3,000 on my $7,000 jalopy sounds like a better deal than $3,000 off the $25,000 new car. Because again, it's all contextual and relative. It increased sales of this car 60,000 units. That's a behavioral economics insight. How long did it take to develop? I don't know, five minutes? How do, we, how do I put that on my timesheet? What do I price for that? But those are the types of insights that behavioral economists can do now, and they can do it in a flash of brilliance, much like the logo. I'm not saying these flash of brilliance are, are common. I know they're outliers. But I think they can happen more and more if we move away from this idea that, no, no, put the napkin away, and let's go back to the office and make them wait for the logo for 12 weeks. Like, that adds any value. I mean, that's just insane. If people who build by the hour built the Concorde, they would have charged it out by the hour. It's crazy. The Concorde's more valuable because it was faster, <laughs> right? The, the slowest horse in the, ra in the race wins under the billable hour model, but not in an outcome model. I really do believe the only place that time spent should matter is in prison. And that's why I'm a anti-timesheet person, and you can't separate timesheets from the pricing model. Because what we measure is really, really important in an agency. What you measure is what you get. And if you measure time, you'll get time, even if it destroys your business. Because people will fudge. We humans are the ultimate scamps. You give us a rule, we'll find a way around it. 
You give us a metric, we'll find a way to game it every time. Accountants make a living off of this. It's called loopholes. <laughs> We're really good at this. And timesheets are probably the worst because they're so fudgeable. So the other thing I wanted to say about that is to run your agency with your timesheets is the equivalent of timing your cookies with your smoke alarm. Because by definition, by the time you see it on a timesheet, it is no longer manageable. We are crying over spilt milk at that point. It, it's coming in after the, you know, the battle and bayonetting the wounded. It doesn't make any sense. We need leading indicators that, that like canaries in the coal mine that help us stave off problems. So a lot of these agencies that have made the change have changed their internal measurements to things that the client cares about promises and turnaround time and things like that and, and access and all those types of things on, on how clients grade us. So I just wanted to leave you with this because this is one agency that did something very creative with this concept of timesheets and I wanted to share it with you because again I think it's the mark of not only great creativity but absolute brilliance. Timesheets are a significant challenge industry-wide. Timesheets are definitely not the most important thing in my day. Who actually has the time to ever do timesheets? Overdue hour submissions can result in a serious loss of revenue for an agency. We need people to record their time accurately. We need them to record it on time, and we need to be able to bill our clients. So we get paid. Introducing Timesheets by BPDO. A revolutionary new timesheet solution that leverages an existing workplace behavior. Going to the toilet. Data showed the average time to complete a timesheet was 18 minutes, the exact amount of time that people spend in the washroom during an average workday. And, incredibly, 100% of time spent on the toilet is also spent on a device. So we put two and number two together and created a new mobile time logging experience, turning unproductive time into very productive time. We're looking at this as an entirely new movement in timesheet management. Timesheets. Now it's never been easier to wipe your timesheets off your to-do list. Excuse me, I have to do my timesheets. Excuse me. Absolutely brilliant, I think. Warren Buffett said the single most important decision in evaluating a business is its pricing power. If you've got a business that can increase its prices by 10%, you've got a great business, which is why he invests in things like Coke and Apple. But if you have to have a prayer session, before increasing your prices by 10%, then you've got a terrible business. And I think this is a pretty prophetic statement from somebody who understands value pretty well, especially when it comes to valuing companies. So pricing is the number one thing you can do to drive profitability in your agency, more so than cost cutting, more so than efficiency gains, more so than rainmaking. Invest in it. Hire pricers or educate people inside your agency to be pricers and turn that function over to them. Pricing has become a profession. It's now a C-suite function in most of corporate, in most of the corporate, uh, large corporations anyway. Usually the pricers report right to the CEO. Why? Because it's where the money is. Because a 1% change in price can have a dramatic impact on the bottom line, far more than anything else you can do in your business. So it pays to experiment with options and different pricing uh, strategies. You don't have to just use one pricing strategy. You can have a whole portfolio. Sometimes your agency might be able to own the IP and, and do what photographers do, charge a, a royalty or a use fee or a license. Or you, can, or you can share and put skin in the game and get paid for certain milestones. Or some one agency in New York called Anomaly does nothing by the, by the billable hour and they're actually more like a venture capital firm and they invest like when Virgin America opened up they actually built the seat back entertainment systems. They didn't do it for a price. They did it for a percentage of the advertising revenue. And it was a really, really profitable engagement. We have to become more profitable with, uh, I mean, more comfortable with taking risks. Stop shying away from risk. Stop asking yourself, well, how do we know if we're going to make money? That's the wrong question. The right question is, how do we maximize the value? And how, how do we get compensated fairly for that? Because that will make for a better client relationship. So folks, this is how you can find me. Um, I do do a radio show, it's on every Friday. You can look at all 200 radio shows at thesoulofenterprise.com. 
It's been an absolute honor to talk to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.